Ciudadanos de las ideas. Hola. Ideístas. Hola. It's so great to be back. Ah, what a breath of fresh air. Because let me tell you, it has been a very strange week back in the USA. Very strange. So it's important to be reminded that there are people like you who are curious, hunger, eager, who want to do good and change the world and learn and grow. It's beautiful. Yes. Anyone in the room here, is anyone an entrepreneur? Raise your, raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Wow, that's nice, nice. Anyone here thinking about maybe quitting their jobs and then starting something that they love, turning into an entrepreneur? Raise your hand if you are. Great, because that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs. And I know what you're thinking. Who the hell is she? She's not even in my program. I'm not even in your program. Check it. Nowhere to be found. I'm the surprise, the wild card. My name is Natasha Tsakos, and I'm an artist. Hey, that's not nice. I heard you. Don't put me in a box. So I actually had to put my life in check before speaking with you this morning. And I don't mean indulging in my biography's accomplishments. I mean retrospecting on the journey so far. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, oh, I guess I'm an entrepreneur too. You know, when we're so busy doing something, we don't have time to call ourselves anything. That's usually what others do to make sense of us. But I've always worked for myself, towards my dreams. I've been hustling, like some of you, since I was six. Six. Staged my first show and went on tour. Okay, it might have been my mother's kitchen, my grandparents' living room, my aunt's apartment, small details. I still toured that family market. I started producing work when I was 16 with friends. And if you know anything about producing, then you know it's similar to building a startup. You have to develop it, design it, find the resources, the funds, the people, the space. One of the space that I had found to put up one of our shows was a strip club. It was perfect, like amazing stage, great sound system, lights. Why not? So I was able to convince the owner to give us his space for free for three weeks. Pretty good negotiating skills, wouldn't you say? I've also been an early investor. As a matter of fact, the only investor in my work. They didn't teach us business skills back in theater conservatory. But I didn't regret it. I paid it back by performing in the streets, performing in the hospitals, performing in nightclubs, dubbing for movies, performing anywhere I could, refining my skills. Tens and thousands of events I've performed in, which all paid back for the bigger work. And my work was always social. So social, in fact, that I ran for president of the United States back in 2000. You probably didn't hear about it because I ran as a clown and got 86 votes within the first hour. I should have probably run again this time around. Huh. And so as I kept going, I was loving it. I was doing what I loved, but I realized that the shows that I was creating were not what I had in my mind. What I was envisioning was cinematic, shape-shifting, like a hallucination without the drugs. And the thing is that there was no roadmap, no script, no developer skits for this kind of work because it didn't exist yet. And that's when things got really interesting. 
because I started asking myself questions I did not know the answers to. And fast forward to today, here I am, living at the intersection of theater and technology, devising new ways of storytelling, and the questions that I'm asking myself today have changed. Today, I want to know how can we create a show that responds to world events and where the audience can respond back? How can actions taken during a show affect the world outside? And that's a pivotal moment, not just for me, because if I'm thinking about this, other artists are too. Then what happens when artists transcend their current medium of expression? What happens when artists switch platforms and begin to innovate? What happens when musicians create software that creates music that can read your brainwaves in real time and alter them? What do we call that? Is it still music? Is it therapy? I don't know. According to the Washington Post a few months ago, the next hot job in Silicon Valley is for poets, fiction writers, comedians, and other artistic types. The tech world is starting to get it. So we have a lot in common. Because historically speaking, artists have always been entrepreneurs. Whether they sought the support of a patron, or were sponsored by the king, or died starving. Artists pursue their passions at all costs. They are willing to sacrifice their comfort for their vision, for their legacy. It's like they're driven by this deep, altruistic mission and total selfish, selfish obsession at the same time. It's irrational and it makes perfect sense. We are in love with what we do. It's the perfect, ultimate, romantic affair. We're not driven by money. We are driven by the desire to bring value to the world instead of reaping value from it. And while some people spend their lifetime searching for meaning, we decide to do something meaningful instead. Social entrepreneurs and artists are made of the same stuff. And it's ironic that we should place social ahead of entrepreneur, isn't it? Because if some of you are social entrepreneurs, what do we call the rest? Unsocial entrepreneurs? Maybe. We've been confusing a lot of things. I believe that the second chapter of this century will be led by the creatives, the nonconformists, the misfits, the marginalized, those who are not afraid to take risks because they've got nothing to lose, those who deeply want to fix something, those who can reimagine the world over and over again. This is the rise of the artful entrepreneur, when artists stretch their entrepreneurial muscles and entrepreneurs stretch their creative ones. Because think about it. When every surface becomes the surface for another surface, who will imagine and write your new realities? In an internet of everything, who will explore the anthropomorphic dynamics of our relationship with everything? If we can gamify learning and then everything else, who will humanize the experience? We are being challenged by a whole new world. And it's not space, not 20,000 leagues under the sea, not even technology. It's our imagination. As entrepreneurs, we are told to prototype quickly, launch early, fail fast, and change 10 million, 1 billion lives. That's great. 
But how do we even get there? What does the creative process of innovation look like? Now, I don't have all the answers. It's a lot of jazz. But since I'm here, allow me to share a few thoughts and provocations that my training and my journey have taught me. Provocation number one. What if we looked at the act of entrepreneurship as a performance art piece instead? Really, because that's the superpower of art. Artists often seem larger than life, able to do really bold things that, as civilians, they might not dare to do. I've been a performer for 20 years, and I can tell you that some of the things that my characters have done, I wouldn't do. I, I know, I know, it sounds crazy, but it's true. For example, I've never sang karaoke in my life. I am terrified of it. But guess what? My character did. Boy, she sang Britney Spears on top of her lungs, and it sounded horrendous, and it was amazing. There is great power in the mask of performance. And the mask doesn't take away from the authenticity, the honesty of your actions but it gives you that extra level of separation that liberates you from judgment, that frees you from hesitation. There's a fine line between inaction and courage. What the present is now teaching us is that whatever crazy ideas we think we have, they're not crazy enough. Whatever we thought was impossible, think again. So how do we get those big, bold ideas? By suspending our disbelief. Because when we suspend our disbelief, we are too prepared to believe anything. So don't think logically. Think surrealistically, absurdly, abstractly, like Dali or Picasso or Kafka, where clocks melt, dimensions collide, where we all turn into cucarachas. Embrace metaphors, because in those moments of suspension is when metaphors, when epiphanies happen. And when you find that epiphany, don't stop at impossible. If someone tells you something is impossible, it only means they do not know how to do it. Truth is, someone somewhere will figure something to make it happen. What if we went to the moon and back? What if we created power out of nuclear waste? What if a network of balloons traveling on the edge of space deployed internet everywhere? Peter Diamandis, founder of the XPRIZE Foundation, said that the, the day before something is a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. So suspend your disbelief. We were told to be interesting to make interesting choices by taking risk, surprising ourselves and others, by always, always surprising our own processes. Today, intelligent algorithms can predict our actions and curate content based on our preferences, ideologies, our linguistic style, our sense of humor. How predictable are we? German Chancellor Angela Merkel said that we are living in bubbles of self-reinforcing views, when we should get as many points of views as possible to gain new perspectives. In times of predictability, be unpredictable. Surprise is key. We were told that every single action that we took needed a sense of urgency. And I think that, that that translates into the real world by being hungry. Be hungry. 
even when you're content and happy, because that's the hardest part. It's easy to find fire and passion out of frustration. But be hungry, not for the things we don't have, but for the things we don't know. That's how we stay hungry, by always asking ourselves questions we do not know the answers to. The futurist Alvin Toffler said that the illiterates of the 21st century will not be those who cannot write and read. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So let's learn how to learn and learn how to like it. Failing. Failing. It's a hot topic. Everybody has their own take on it. One of the greatest lessons I learned from clowning, and believe me, there's so much to learn from clowning, and I'm not joking. Failing, falling, is funny. We can't take ourselves so seriously. Now, how is it that in considerably little time, actors can completely transform and become different characters than, than themselves, with different set of beliefs, different voices, different accent, different memories? I mean, that's not theater training stuff anymore. That's like covert special agent training stuff. So the, how do they do it? By creating their new realities, by immersing themselves in it. This is how our brains train, how we can fool our mirror neurons into believing it is real. We're all talking about Magic Leap, HoloLens, Oculus Rift, Samsung, Meta, Google's Daydream, and they keep on coming. But we all have an embedded, augmented reality headset called imagination. It's free. Use it. Simplicity always wins. It's easy nowadays to overcomplicate everything. But sometimes silence can be more powerful than words. Stillness more effective than motion. Sometimes the solutions you're looking for are the simplest ones. And finally, play. Play, play, play. Find playfulness with everything. Linda Neyman, who focuses on innovation and leadership, says, when we engage in what we're naturally suited to do, our work takes on the quality of play, and it is play that stimulates creativity. Because when we are passionate about something, we do not count the hours, the minutes spent. We will dedicate a decade, a lifetime to what matters. We all here, all of us, can change the world. There's no excuses anymore. We all have access to information, resources, network like we never did before. Some might have a better head start than others. Some might be lucky, some might have better timing. But in the end, the outcome is dictated by our attitude, our character, our creativity. And dare I say today, our elegance. Success is our personal story. Today, we are celebrating a global movement of radical ideas that create positive change. We are celebrating Pitch at Palace, founded by His Royal Highness, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, and the entrepreneurs who will be presenting for us today, because they're doing just that. Mind-controlled mechanical legs, technologies for the deaf, blind, and illiterate, 
non-invasive non anemia detection, detection of retina diseases, portable dry household toilets, eliminating organic waste, transforming plastic waste into beautiful pieces, solar-powered streetlights, smokeless cooking, organic powder cleaning up our rivers, fighting crime using GPS and citizen power. <laughs> and look at us here. The dream of Ricardo Salinas and Andres Romer nine years ago. And we're just getting started. The game is just beginning. The board is blank. There's no roadmap for it. We are all going to have we are all going to have to imagine it over and over again. So surprise yourself. Thank you. Thank you.